Okay, so good afternoon everyone. I hope I'm clear enough. Today is a very interesting topic and this is literally my speciality. So a lot of times you will all be hearing from your friends and everyone that, yeah, uh, that EP study, uh, you know, is being done for arrhythmia. So EPS actually stands for EP study, electrophysiological study. So what is EP actually? What is EPS is all about actually? So I think as everyone can understand it well, so this is the study of heart's electrical system. Okay. And you are trying to assess the function of each component of the cardiac conduction. And during that time, when you are trying to study that, you are not only trying to identify the mechanism of an arrhythmia, but also you try to see for the potential of a patient, if the patient can have an arrhythmia. And you also evaluate whether there is any need for treatment or therapy to the patient. So it is literally a multi-dimension test. It's not like, you know, you just go put some catheters in a blade. No. It's a multi-component, multi-faceted test. And of course, a therapy as well. And I must tell you, being students of medicine, this is the only curative branch of medicine in which you literally cure from the you know uh, the, from the root of the problem so a lot of times no other uh, alternative system of medicine people like ayurveda or homeopathy people they say it like we are curing from the root cause so literally that's what is being done even in the ep as well so you cure the disease it's not like you know you go and put the stent and still it may happen again or you know the component is going to be still there you have just pushed the away those lipid core actually or the plaque so why why you would like to do when is actually the need to do a ep study so what happens is if there's a, an unexplained syncope and you may know the patient has a structural heart disease and of course if someone complains of palpitations or there's a documented inappropriate rapid pulse rate without any apparent cause. So for example, tachycardia is there, simple science tachycardia. If you see, you know, thyrotoxicosis, then you know the etiology. But when there is tachycardia, but you don't know what could be the possible reason for that. That is a reason. Similarly, if someone has had a cardiac arrest with non q MI or if someone has even had a cardiac arrest which has happened more than 48 hours after myocardial infarction has happened so then also it must be done and similarly when you are trying to put up a device to treat an arrhythmia okay or those who already have a device and they require therapy so, for example, you are trying to see for the safety or efficacy of the device. Is it good enough or not? So, those were the must indications. So, they must be done. So, that is why it was called as class 1. And if you do that, definitely it is going to benefit the patients. Then class 2. Class 2 indications are if someone has had a history of sinus node dysfunction, so then you are trying to exclude what a the other arrhythmic uh, reasons and what was the reason actually or the mechanism for the dysfunction and how is the drug response to the direct therapy as well. Similarly, in second or third degree AV block, you're trying to determine the site or mechanism of the block in order to direct the therapy for that. So, so it's not uh, like third degree AV block, boom. You just go and put up a pacemaker. No, that's not the way. If you're trying to do a pacemaker as well, I'll try to show you some of the side effects as well. It's easy for people to just go and implant up a pacemaker, but there can be a lot of side effects as well for that. Similarly, if there is a patient with bundle branch block and patient is symptomatic and you see there is conduction delay and you want to evaluate or think for the therapy or even the prognosis as well, Similarly, if there is a patient with 
premature ventricular complex. And you don't know what is the reason for presyncope or syncope as well. So in simple words, if you really want to summarize, if someone has access to pathway, you know someone has had an arrhythmia or unexplained syncope or even medication intolerance as well. Or someone is getting ventricular premature beats or with palpitations. So you must do an EP study. But when you should not do, when you know that, yeah, it is a clear-cut indication for a pacemaker or ICD implant, or there's a recent history of myocardial infarction, or the patient is not so symptomatic. So these were the electrical conduction problems in which it is indicated that you must do. But other than that, there are plenty of new indications as well in which you must do an EP study in which, for example, like if the patient has an atrial fibrillation, let it be any type, paroxysmal, persistent, permanent as well. And permanent, hmm, it can be a little bit uh, not so indicated as well because it has been shown that even 5% of AF patients can have some SVTs in fact. Similarly, the complex VT patients, because you will be able to know its mechanism. Is it associated with RV dysfunction? There's ischemic VT, fascicular VT, or bundle branch reentry VT as well. Okay, now I'll try to give you some really good insights, or I would say I will try to test a little bit of your knowledge. So these are some of the practical slides, okay, which we are going to see. What do you see in this ECG? I'll give you a history. So this uh, young person, as you can see already, age 20 years, this person comes into the OPD or the polyclinic. Everything was said, oh, everything is fine and all. You should go back home and all without taking any history. But later on, on careful examination, something else was noted. So what was it actually? And there was a family history of certain cardiac death. Now I'll tell you. So you should, first thing is, you should never trust the computer's report, which is there with the ECG. What you can see, for example, sinus bradycardia with sinus arrhythmia. You should never trust these examples. So do you know what is the real diagnosis for this patient? Uh, uh, sir, ST elevation in late 3, uh, and ABF. Okay. It's a long wave. It seems like it's not exactly epsilon wave. So this is what is called as early repolarization syndrome or juvenile pattern. So in this classically what happens is you will be seeing some ST elevation. So early juvenile pattern, earlier the thinking was that it's benign and normal. So you did not bother about that early repolarization syndrome actually. So, but there are some studies now, especially in the Scandinavian countries, in which it was shown that this type of patients are exposed to sudden cardiac death or easily predisposed to develop ventricular fibrillation. So, ideally, you should try to see them if they are predisposed for arrhythmias. And yes, if there is positive family history, you should try to think accordingly as well. Uh, maybe you should try to think for the ICDs. Okay. So, what do you notice in this ECG now? What is happening over here? And okay, I did something in this ECG now. So what has been done? Yes, but what was done? What was done? What happened that all of a sudden V1, V2 has changed? V3 is same, V4 is same. So what had happened is this gentleman had come, as you can see, uh, with changes on the left side. But what happened is, once after seeing this, a simple trick was done. V1 and V2 will... Be... No. If it was given, then V3, V4, both would have also changed, no? So what had happened was, we just had put the V1 and V2 two intercostal spaces higher above. Isn't it? You did not, uh, uh, you know, uh, put so much of extra money or something. It's just a simple test. And yeah, 
when you see some positive changes you just do it and you see the results immediately okay okay now let's go to the next case Sir, this is so this is brugada but as i said it what i wanted to emphasize was on the maneuver what you did you didn't do any extra money expenditure it doesn't need so much of and all but the thing is simple thing is you just take those v1 and v2 leads keep them to leads just higher keep it in the second intercostal space yeah so just keep them two intercostal spaces a little bit higher close to the border as i said it wherever you can see good amplitude that is the main thing okay, okay. okay. now what do you notice in this ecg now okay and some change is happening so this person is there and then something happens and then this patient becomes like this so what happened actually so i will try to show you both the ecgs i hope everyone is having a copy as well it has been all the dropbox link has been shared with everyone so this is the previous one and this is the later one so what happens and this is the later one as you can see on your screen now what happens yes it is brugada but what has been done it is not rbbb pattern and all okay everything is normal do you understand so what had happened was this patient because the ecg changes were a little bit doubtful so the easy thing was i know in uh, a lot of countries ajmalin is not available so it can be very difficult so but what you can try to do is instead of ajmalin you can try to use group 1c drugs what are the other group 1c drugs what are the group 1c drugs which we all can use because 1c drugs i know it's available in most of the countries ajmalin may not be available for example even in netherlands i know like it it is not available so what uh, in 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 at maastricht what they do is like uh, they will get it from germany all the way they will import it from there and use it so what was done is one c group anti arrhythmic drug was given and you can see this changes so what was exactly done is flecanid 100 mg was given orally okay in can eat flick in eat puff in on like that okay now what is happening in these ecgs do they all look similar what do you notice what is the characteristic so because a lot of times what will be happening is you will see these ecgs and then you will ignore them oh this is like right bundle branch block pattern or left bundle branch block pattern but what you are seeing on this ecg 1 2 3 4 5 6 they all are different can anyone tell me what is the different what is the difference what do you notice what is the difference So in this ECG, now I'll try to make it easier for you guys. So if you will notice, there are different types of R, S, R dash. Sometimes one can be bigger, second component can be bigger, and in the last one, second and the third component can be bigger. So that's why it is like a right bundle branch block. But there's a big but for this. In the fourth one, when you notice. Does anyone remember what we taught yesterday? Josephson criteria and Brugada's criteria. Yes, sir. 
So what was Brigada's criteria? Come on, yesterday itself we spoke about it. Come on. I, uh, I'm feeling disappointed now. So, Brigada's criteria was from the nadir of the QRS, from the beginning of the QRS to the nadir of S wave. If it is more than 100 milliseconds, it is Josephson criteria positive. Brugada's sign was, what was Brugada's sign? Brugada's sign was, if there is a notch near the nadir of S wave, this will be called as a, what sign? Josephson sign. Okay, I can hear some nice voice as well from someone else. Okay, good, good. So I mean is this is what these are the things you should try to read because otherwise it will always be a problem. Okay, anyways, so once you know about all these things, what do you notice in this? There's notching in the S wave. Here as well, here as well, here as well. But this is not RS R dash. Isn't it? You can't call it as RS R dash pattern. Similarly, here as well, you notice what is called as the notched R wave. There's notching, but in the R wave. Similarly, what is this fragmented QRS? So in fragmented QRS, what will happen is there are more than two deflections. So that's why it is called as fragmented. So these are the indirect parameters of increased risk of sudden cardiac death. So in these kind of patients as well, a diagnostic EP study should be conducted to rule out any reasons for sudden cardiac death. So what is happening in this ECG, this patient actually? In the next one. I think you all are not reading it well, what is happening. So what do you notice in this ECG? Let's try to go step by step. What is the rate? Is it tachycardia or sinus rhythm? So it is sinus. So you see a P wave. Normal yes. So, so no, you see a P wave. Then there is QRS. Then after that there is a T wave, right? So this is sinus wave rhythm. Rate. Rhythm. So rate, as I said, it's not tachycardia. Rate, rhythm. Then axis. What is the axis? Axis is normal. Then after that, you should try to see further different intervals. What do you notice? PR is shortened. Right? And there's some delta wave, slurring of the over here. There's some slurring. So this is what is called as the delta wave. So what it means is, and then you notice is there, it is right bundle branch block, isn't it? And it tends to be altogether positive and there is early transition. It continues to be all positive. So V1 to V6, V6 is all positive. So what do you further notice in this? So this is right bundle branch block, normal axis with delta. So this is accessory pathway. So in this accessory pathway now, how will you further localize? How do you localize? So what you do is, as now you know, right bundle branch block. So it is left sided. Left sided. Even in left sided, what you see is one is positive. AVL is also almost positive. So what it is? Left lateral. Isn't it? 
So I'll give you another hint now. Something was done for this patient and then the ECG became like this. So what happened over here? So after that, of course, the patient had undergone ablation and then the pre-excitation was gone because the accessory pathway was ablated. So that's why